Good morning. Just want to welcome you all to Christ Chapel. If this is your first Sunday with us, we want to say welcome. Uh, before you leave here, make sure you go out to the visitor center back there and grab something uh, for coming this morning and joining us. We're so glad that you're here. We simply want to say welcome and thank you for coming this morning. Also, um, I want to just say, uh, before I share a little bit about the offering, I want to say thanks to, to everyone for your cards, your gifts, for the love that you shared with us last Sunday and our pastors. And uh, we deeply appreciate it and we feel blessed. And it's nice to work in a church where you feel loved. And uh, that's important. Amen? Because I know some people who work in churches that they don't feel loved. And, uh, and we feel this morning, I just want to say a big thank you. I also want to say thank you to all the volunteers that uh, helped out yesterday with Day of Hope. Uh, we may have a picture that you can throw up there just for a second, and I'm not sure if it's there or not. And um, But Day of Hope yesterday was a big success, and a lot of you volunteered and helped, and I want to say thanks for that. But I want to say a special thanks to someone, and that's Pastor Joe. And uh, could you all give him a hand? <clears throat> this, I know that a lot of churches are involved in this, but it takes place at our church. Joe organizes all of it. He puts it all together. It went well, and I just want to say thanks to Pastor Joe for all that you do, and uh, it's, a, it's a long day, and he did a great job, and we deeply appreciate that. You know, in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we've heard this verse so many times, uh, and yet I find that when you read it, it kind of unlocks some meanings. It says there, for God so loved the world that he gave. And I often think about the fact that, that Christianity and, and serving Jesus Christ, it all begins right there because God didn't give us something semi-good. He gave us his very best. He gave us his son. And how many of you know that if we're going to be Christ-like, God expects us in turn to give our very best? Amen? That's simply a part of what takes place. You know, in Ephesians chapter 5, Verse 2, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Imitators of God as your children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling aroma. And I say that to you this morning because when we take up our tithe and offerings, and guys, come on forward this morning, when we take up our offering and our tithes, God loved us so much that he gave his best. We love him so much that we should give our best. That should, be, that should be the telling sign of who we are as we give of our tithe and offering. So as we take up the offering this morning, I would encourage you, put your love into action. It tells you up there where you can give, how you can give, the different ways you can give. We don't have just one way. We'll take your money any way you want to give it. And, uh, and God will turn around and bless it any way he wants. Amen. So Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We know that you gave your only son for us because you love us. And we know that it is your nature to give good gifts to your children. And dear God, as an example of our love towards you, may we give the same way in return. May you bless this offering as it's used for your kingdom. And we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you look in your bulletin, you're going to see a blue sheet of paper to kind of help you along this morning. If you didn't get one of those when you came in, you can go to ChristChapelPC.com. Go to resources and you'll find one in there already filled out for you. Uh, you can go to um, my church app, the same thing, you'll find it there. So there's various ways that you can get into it. But I want to get into the message this morning. I've been excited about sharing this um, because I love to share God's Word. In Mark chapter 8, verses 13 through 21, it says this, And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? I want to share a little bit this morning about the fact of, of uh, we find ourselves so oft, often 
bogging down in our spiritual growth simply because of the fact that the challenges before us look impossible. And we live in a world right now where I think people are saying, man, can things get any worse? I'm here to tell you, yes, they can. And I hate to tell you that, that's not the most popular thing, but there's, there's so much frustration, and frustration is, is not new. I think the one who composed the little course must have experienced this, uh, and most, some of you might know the song, Got Any Rivers You Think Are Uncrossable? Got Any Mountains You Can't Tunnel Through? God specializes in things thought impossible, and He will do what no other power can do. And uh, that is the God that we serve. But if things seem a little bit difficult today, just wait, they'll soon be impossible. It'll be to a place where uh, it'll be uncrossable rivers, untunneled mountains, and impossible circumstances really aren't that unusual. So I want to ask you this morning, how do you handle them? How do you handle that situation? Where do you get the faith to meet them? I want to give you some scriptures this morning that maybe will give you the faith to be able to meet those impossibilities in your life. And so to put everything in the right perspective, I want to share four key, four key passages of Scripture that I would say address the subject of impossibilities. Two are in Jeremiah chapter 32, and two are in the book of Luke. And in Jeremiah 32, 17, I love the Scripture. It says, All Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Everybody say that. Nothing is too hard for you. Do you realize that whatever thing or things you're calling impossibilities can be superimposed over what God says? Nothing. Nothing. In other words, my job, it's not too hard for him. Uh, My problems are not too hard for him. My sickness is not too hard for you, Lord. My schoolwork is not too hard because sometimes we think our schoolwork's impossible. And um, in fact, it's even hard to reconstruct in the English language the full color or the impact of the Hebrew words here used in this verse. Uh, The best that we can maybe say is no, absolutely nothing for you is extraordinary or surpassing. And it brings, the text brings or begins with the strongest negatives maybe in the Hebrew language that no, nothing, absolutely nothing for you, Lord. You cannot surprise God. There's nothing that he cannot handle. And then Jeremiah 32, verse 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? He's now asking you the question, is anything too hard for me? And God's asking you to to substitute your impossibilities for the word anything. Is, and you put in that, that line there in your notes, what is too hard, you think? He's saying, is that too hard for me? And the answer implied here, of course, is absolutely not. Nothing is too difficult, too hard and you, for, for, for him. And you might be thinking this morning, well, you know what? You Christians who have a lot of past miracles in your repertoire, that's easy for you to think that way. You don't have to have any miracles in your repertoire to know that God can do absolutely anything in your life. Amen? He can do anything. I don't even have to know your situation. All I need to know and all you need to know is God and his promises. He is Lord. That's the bottom line. And there's nothing too difficult for him. Now, in Luke 137, I want you to kind of connect the passage with Jeremiah. It's an answer to Mary's question uh, concerning her conception. And an angel appears to her and said, you're going to bear the Christ child. And she says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? How is that possible? And do you recall the answer that was given to her? Luke 137, it says, For nothing will be impossible with God. The same thing we just read in Jeremiah. Nothing is impossible with God. Your river, your mountain, any impossibility, your job, your school, your marriage, uh, keeping your house clean, uh, doing the wash, uh, Whatever it might be, that, that, that thing you think, this is impossible, I can never get all this done. God says, nothing is impossible with me. So when you ask the Lord to handle a specific impossibility, and then you leave it with him in a faith that simply will not doubt, and uh, God can do something. Now, I want to give you an impossible event this morning. And it's in John chapter 6, 
And, and we find not only a familiar event, but it's a unique one. Uh, first, for a couple reasons. In John chapter 6, it's, it is the only miracle I think mentioned in all four Gospels. So I think there's some importance uh, coming with that. Second of all, I think it's the only account in which Jesus maybe asked the advice of someone else. And uh, not that he really needed it, but it was more of a test. The third thing I see in this is that it's the only time Jesus performed a miracle before, I think, such a huge crowd. And fourthly of all, it's an absolute miracle. It's not some natural thing that was altered slightly. I mean, it is a miracle. How many of y'all like to see miracles? How many of y'all have seen miracles? Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. People say, well, they don't do them nowadays. Yeah, they, miracles still take place. And uh, so the first thing I want to realize here as we read this is... Uh, there's three words. This is after these things. And when you read that in the Bible, you need to understand the fact, always ask yourself, what things? What's taking place when it says after these things? And there's five other chapters that precede John chapter 6. And if you suddenly come into it in the middle of the story, it's kind of like coming into it in the middle of a novel. You don't know what's taking place. What's the background behind it? So let me give you a little bit of the background. Jesus has chosen his disciples. Uh, he has sent them out for ministry. According to Matthew, they have gone into every village in the area. They've proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, the message of repentance. And now they're back with Jesus, and they're tired, and they're perhaps weary. They've preached in every nook and cranny. I mean, they have physically exhausted. Emotionally, they're worn out. The Lord desires to be alone with them and to rest. And it's important for all of us in our work to have times of refreshment. I told Joe, I said, you need to take some, you need to take some days off <laughs> after last week. And Joe looked at me like, I can't. I said, no, yeah, you can. And uh, well, you need times of refreshment. How many of y'all found that if you don't have times of refreshment, people around you wish you would take them? <laughs> and uh, and uh, you can become, uh, well, you, get, you need times of refreshment. And so he wanted to provide his hardworking men the opportunity to get away from the crowd after these things. So John 6, 1 through 3. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. So picture the scene. Jesus and his disciples are alone on the mountain. They're having some R&R. &R. It says in John 6, 5 that when Jesus looked up, he saw a great crowd coming, uh, coming toward him. And they're tired, they're weary, they want to be alone. Jesus looks up and sees this enormous crowd approaching. According to verse 10, it's about 5,000 people. Uh, Matthew 14, 21 says it's 5,000 plus, plus women and children. So uh, we'll just be saved and save 5,000. That, that's enough right there. That's a lot of folks with a lot of needs, 5,000 people. And here they are in a barren place. And wouldn't you know it, the tribe is hungry. I mean, if they're going to come, at least they should bring food with them. But they didn't. They're hungry, and wouldn't you know it, there's no high V, there's no price chopper in the vicinity, and uh, so they're in a bit of a predicament. The disciples don't know anyone. They're not aware of any source of food. It's an impossible situation. And guess what? That's exactly the way Jesus wanted it. Now, I want you to understand this morning that at times, God puts you in impossible situations. Well, you think, what did I do to deserve this? Why did my cell phone go off in church? You know, and uh, sorry, Brother Willard, I'm just giving you a hard time. And uh, someday you all are going to be mean and all of you are going to turn your cell phones on at the same time. And um, I always remember a time in, uh, in Heidelberg when Ken was asking everybody to shut their cell phones off. So I called his while he was making the announcement. And of course, his ringer went off and we told him to put a dollar in the jar. No, I'm just joking. And uh, God it puts you in impossible situations. And I want you to understand this morning that he's doing this for your benefit. You're thinking, what have I done wrong to be put in this situation? God may be putting you in, into a situation because you need to see a miracle. There's something he wants to do in your life. Why did he do it? Well, these disciples are just like, like you and me. I mean, oh, no, Lord, what on earth are we going to do? And that's the way the disciples looked at it. How can we feed so many people? Jesus saw it as a perfect opportunity to, 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 to have a class A miracle. 
And Jesus uses every opportunity in your life to make you better, to make you grow. So I want you to understand, no matter what you're going through right now this morning, you might say, this is impossible. Maybe God is going to use that to make you stronger than you were last week. Okay? He wants you to grow. He wants you to become stronger where you're at. And, I mean, he had to explain to them that, hey, listen, I'm the Son of God. I'm God in the flesh. They had learned all this in theory back in their boot camp days, but now it was time to see some action. Don't let your Christian walk be based merely on theories. Come to a point where what you have learned, you've also tested. And God has proven himself to you. Okay, it's one thing to read the scriptures. It's something else to live the scriptures. And say, hey, I've been through this. I've seen what takes place. And uh, let your life be founded on times when you can look back and you say, I saw God in action. I saw God do the impossible. And it's time to go from sterile theory to be replaced with solid reality. So the first thing you can write down is the test of Philip. And um, in that chat, in that in J, J, or John 6, 5, he's the first one to get the exam. It says there, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? I, I'll just tell you this. I think Philip was probably not the smartest of the disciples. I don't know why I'm saying that, but I really think Judas might have been the sharpest. And uh, I mean, that it's often true of wolves and false prophets, by the way, but he had a lot of head knowledge. I think he just lacked heart knowledge and commitment. Philip was not in charge of the supplies. I mean, Judas was a treasure, but he didn't ask Judas. Why? Well, in verse 6, it says, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus knew what he was intending to do. He always does. But when he asks you a question, it's for a learning. Something he wants to teach you in your life. And he knows how we're going to wind up before we ever make any decisions. I mean, it's not some cataclysmic thing where one day you're this, the next day you're totally this, all mature. How many of y'all found your life as a process? That sanctification is a process. Everything's a process in your Christian walk. That hopefully you're stronger now than you were three years ago, two years ago, last week. As you learn the process that God has for your life. And he says to Philip, where are we going to find bread to feed all these people? Why Philip? To establish his depth of faith. He wanted to determine, has Philip learned to trust me? Uh, will Philip focus on my abilities? How many of y'all have ever had God kind of throw a question out to you like that? How are you going to handle this? How are you going to handle this situation? Are you going to trust in me? Or are you going to try and do it with your own ingenuity? And how many of y'all have found that usually with your own ingenuity, it doesn't work out too well? Yeah. And uh, let me give you a little insight into Philip. It makes you maybe appreciate even more that Jesus asked him. Uh, Philip was the one, I think, who later said to Jesus, uh, just let us see God and we won't have to ask any more questions. And uh, kind of that attitude. He was the fellow who had to see everything. Um, I would call him maybe the statistical pessimist. He had a slide rule for a mind. And if he could figure it all out, it was all great. Before we criticize him, I think most of us are like that. I think we say, God, just show yourself and then we'll believe you. And, uh, and how many know it takes faith to believe him when you can't see him? And uh, so it's easy to dress up our doubts in, in, in neat-sounding, logical, sophisticated garb. But when Jesus asked the question, here's the answer Philip gave in verse 7. Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. That's not the question the Lord asked. And uh, there's two different conversations going on. The Lord says, where do we go? And Philip says, how much? Back in those days, a denarius was, uh, was worth about 17 cents and equal to a man's daily wages. And it wasn't going to provide enough to cover what they had. And the statement um, here, uh, the, all the Lord wanted Philip to say was, I don't know, it's impossible. This is impossible with me. I can't do it without you. I'm going to wait and see what you're going to do. I mean, that's what the Lord wants to hear from us. You're the specialist. But that's not what Philip does. And if you are a Philip, that's the way you are. We say, oh, no, that, that won't work. When a situation 
gets worse, uh, you can't handle it, it never dawns on you to simply trust God. And I want to challenge you this morning because all you can see is what can't be done. And we're going to talk about these little pledge forms a little bit at the end here this morning. And uh, you're going to say, well, I can't give to missions because I don't make enough money. And uh, hey, we're the, we're the wealthiest people in the world. All of you here are considered rich in the world's comparisons. When you compare people around the world with us, we are the wealthy. Everybody here, probably except for one, came here in a car. Most people don't have cars around the world. Well, we have, and we have refrigerators. How many of y'all have more than one TV in your house? Uh, you're not watching it right now. Some of you are maybe online are watching it right now, and you should have been here. I know there's a football game going on. That threw me completely off. So let me give you the test of Andrew. Because Andrew, is, there's another test here. And the testing's not over. He walks up, and he was as different from Philip as night and day. Philip saw only the situation, the size of the problem. He did not remember how big God is. But in verses 8 and 9, it says, Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with, with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Now, I want to tell you right off the bat, and, I, bat, and I've shared this before with you, that I feel sorry for Andrew. Every time Andrew is mentioned, he's mentioned as Simon Peter's brother. How would you like to be known by that? Hey, you know, I'm Rick, you know, you know Scott's brother. And uh, you wouldn't even be known otherwise, but you're always remembered by somebody else. And this is kind of where Andrew's at. And Andrew had one strong thing going for him when I look at this story. Any man who can talk a little fella out of his lunch must have some degree of persuasion. He got some little boy's lunch. I don't know how he did it, but he goes, there's a lad here who has five loaves and two fish. Well, how did he know that? Andrew must have been going around checking out people's backpacks, snooping around. You got anything in there to eat? And wrestling around through the crowd. And he approached the Lord and said, here's five loaves and two fish. I wish so bad Andrew would have stopped right there. He said, you know what? Here's five loaves and two fish. But he went on and said, but what are these for so many people. He volunteered information he wasn't even asked. It's almost like walking up and giving the Lord the lunch sack and walking away saying, I mean, you might as well eat it. Nobody else is going to get any. And I think little thinking like that sometimes turns a big God off that we serve. Our big God wants to give you big answers. He wants to give you the incredible. And this is applicable to all the Andrews who are hardworking, you're diligent, and uh, but who are shot down by the prospect of the odds. This simply can't take place. You hear the needs and yet uh, the unreached multitudes, but you don't know how you can respond. You tuck your little kids into bed at night and you say, you know what, Lord, I've got two, three or four kids and they're all yours, but what's that among so many needs that are out there in the world today? And uh, I want you to know that God sees the masses, but God also sees the individual. He sees you as one person with the potential to do the impossible in your life. You know, you might be the person who says, you know what, God, I, I can only give $10 a month to a faith promise, and, uh, and that's all. I, when I look at my, my finances, I know you're saying give 20 or give 30 or whatever, but this is all I can give. I'm telling you, understand that you serve a big God who gives big answers. And if you allow him in faith, he will do the incredible in your life. We say sometimes, well, God, I can't pray 10 hours a day. I'm working 50 hours a week. You know, all I can give you is 10 minutes. I'll tell you what, 10 minutes of prayer is better than nothing of prayer. God takes a little. And it's amazing how he can multiply it. And maybe you don't have a lot to give, but I want you to know you can get beyond Andrew. So let's get to the miracle. Because that's all the Lord needs is for you to give him something. And if you remember the story... In a quiet, modest fashion, Jesus said, have all the people sit down, told his disciples. And in this story, the 12 are going to get personally involved in carrying out the miracle because the miracle was basically for their benefit, I don't think for the multitudes. He could have fed the thousands any way he wanted. He could have had manna fall from heaven, but he used the disciples to be a part of the miracle. And here's what it says in verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, 
and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Now, you can't fully appreciate this until you realize that the fish here, if, if, if my commentaries are right, said they were like little pickled fish. They weren't like giant sea bass. Got these two little fish, let's, let's just like a sardine, and, uh, and then you got these barley loaves that are kind of like the size of a large pancake, but they're hard, and they're brittle, it's poor people bread. And Jesus took the brittle loaves and the tiny fish in his hands, and he pulls off the impossible. I mean, when you look at this, the multitudes are sitting there, and the 5,000 people sitting on the slopes of the mountains, and these disciples are busy passing out food, first of all to the dozen, then the hundred, and then the thousands. And remember Philip, uh, Figuring out all the minimums, the Bible says in verse 11, they got as much as they wanted. In other words, I want seconds, I want thirds, I want fourths, and can you picture how this takes place? And here's some old fellow down there, he's not eating for a long time, he's saying, hey, Philip, a little bit more bread. Philip's shaking his head, figuring, how is this taking place? All they wanted. In John 6, 12, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. The King James says, and when they were filled. Isn't that just like our Lord? He gives you enough, not just to barely get by, but he blesses you abundantly. He gives you plenty. He is the specialist who does the impossible. When the rivers cross, the mountains tunnel, the impossible is accomplished, and uh, the people are filled, when they're all as full as they can possibly be, then Jesus says, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. You got 12 disciples, and they got 12 baskets full of leftovers. They started with a little bit of bread and two fish. That is an impossible situation. How many disciples? 12. How many baskets? 12. And can't you picture Philip? He's way down at the bottom of the hill. His basket is full. And all the way back up, he's saying, I can't believe this. This is amazing. I can't believe how this takes place. And it was more than they could ever use. And Andrew, the little guy, the little thinker's got to be stunned. And I say, what is the key to all of this? The key to all of this is releasing a grip on what you think you have. You hang on to everything and you need to release the grip. And if you put it in the hands of God, he does the impossible. It it cannot become the impossible until if you're the little lad, your lunch gets put into the hands of Jesus. Can you picture a little lad going home saying, you know what, mom? I went to this meeting. There was this man called Jesus. He stole my lunch. And mom, you aren't going to believe it. He stole my lunch, those two little fish and those five barley loaves. And mom, that fed 5,000 people. I ate all I could possibly eat. I've never eaten that much. Why? He released his grip on what he had. I'm telling you this morning, the only way we ever get through missions and through all of this is when we release our grip. When we come to a point where we realize we got to put it into the hands of the specialist. And let God do his thing. So write this down. When you face an impossibility, leave it in the hands of the specialist. Realize what he can do. Refuse to calculate or, or doubt or work it out by yourself. Refuse to worry or encourage others to worry. Stand against that and say, Lord, I'm carrying something I cannot handle. I put my trust in you. You persevere through the impossibilities. The problem is that the Lord gets all the leftovers sometimes, all of our mistakes, and all of our, we've tied things to the 19 granny knots, and then we say, okay, Lord, it's, it's yours. Give it to the Lord first. And watch what he does. When I was pastoring in Dallas, I heard a story about a little boy in Dallas who, he was in a family, this couple had four kids in the family, and every night at prayer, Timmy would pray to Jesus for a, a, a shirt. God, I know you can give me a shirt. Lord, I believe you're going to give me a shirt. Lord, when am I going to get my shirt? I want a new shirt. And he would pray this every night over the dinner table. And a few weeks went by and a Christian business, uh, uh, a Christian business was having a July clearance. And this man calls a family and says, I don't, I don't know. I think I heard that you have a little boy who, uh, who wears a size seven shirt. And the Lord's impressed me upon me to, 
to give you 12 size 7 boy shirts. Uh, would that work? And the parents were just flabbergasted. They said, yeah, that'll work. So that night, that night at prayer time, before he could ask God for a t-shirt or a new shirt, the family began to pull out these shirts. And the little boy was exuberant. He'd been praying for a new shirt, and God doesn't do things in a small way. God gave him 12 shirts. I'll tell you what, that little boy, Timothy, he believed for the rest of his life, you know what, when you ask God for something, he'll take care of it. God will meet your needs if you simply put your trust in who he is. We don't usually give God those kinds of chances. We're so totally, and I might say simply, confident in ourselves that we don't put it in the hands of the specialist and let God do his work. So if something is humanly impossible, then what in the world are we doing trying to pull it off? So when I look at this story, let me share one more story here. And that is, uh, it's in Mark chapter 9. I had to throw it in there. It says in verses 20 through 23, So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Here's what Jesus says. If you can said Jesus. Everything is possible for him who believes. It's the only place in Scripture I know where Jesus made that kind of statement. Lord, if you can help, what do you mean if I can help? If I can, and what a great response from our Lord when he said, if you can. He was basically saying, hey, I'm the specialist. These are the things I do. I can do the impossible. And the the Father's response is commendable because when he realized this, in Mark 9, 24, he says, I do believe Help me overcome my unbelief. How many of y'all can say that needs to be your prayer? Help me overcome my unbelief that I might be able to believe. So what's God saying to you? All things are possible to him that worries? No. All things are possible to him who tries to work it out? No. All things are possible to him who believes. So the story in Mark 9 is that he saves the boy's life and he receives healing. And the work that God wants to accomplish is not going to take place while you sit here. It's going to take place under the pressure of impossibilities, uh, when it's upon your shoulders. God specializes in things we think are totally impossible. But being a gentleman, he won't grab them out of your hands. He waits for you to release your grip. So let me wrap this up this morning. And by the way, Isaiah 30, 18 says this, Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy. Your impossible situation. So let me go back to Mark chapter 8, and I'm going to close. In verses 13 through 21. Then he left them, got back into the boat, crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand or your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? So I want you to picture here, these disciples are in a boat. They see an old loaf of bread laying there that was probably from the last time they went on a fishing expedition, and it dawns on them that they have forgotten to bring bread. All they have is a a soggy old loaf. What can Jesus do with your soggy loaf? Well, he can do an awful lot. He can do an awful lot. So he says, I want you to remember. And in verses 18 through 20, he says, when I had seven loaves, How many people did I feed? They said 4,000. Oh, okay. But when I had five loaves, two less, how many people did I feed? Wait, you fed 5,000. Two less loaves, 1,000 more people. If you keep doing the math, you take away and you get down to three loaves, how many people could could Jesus feed? 6,000. 
So now you're stuck with one soggy loaf, two less. How many people could I feed? Well, you could feed 7,000. With less, more takes place. 7,000 people, I mean, seven uh, loaves of bread, 4,000 people. Five loaves of bread, 5,000 people. Three loaves of bread, 6,000 people. And not only did it was only one loaf, it was, I think, one soggy loaf. I mean, you can feed more than seven. He said, why are you worried about having something? I can feed 7,000 people with that one loaf. I'm here to tell you this morning, you got a faith promise card, and you're thinking, oh, great, it's that time of the year where we take up our faith promises. And, you know, I don't have anything to give. Christmas is right around the corner. I tell you what, the only way we support missionaries is primarily through this right here. And you might say, all I have is one soggy loaf. I'm here to tell you this morning, what can God do with your one loaf? You might say, well, you know, Lord, it's only going to be, you know, well, I have nothing I can sacrifice. I would challenge you. Wouldn't it be great if everybody here sacrificed one going out a week to help touch missionaries all around the world? How many of y'all found that going out has gotten expensive? And uh, it's not as much, it's not as cheap as it used to be. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God wants to use you to bless missionaries and to help us support missionaries around the world. And you might only have one loaf. Usually we think in minimums. We're like, oh, that's all I got. I, I can't give any more. I'm gonna, I, asked that the, I asked them to put, put these on all. I put them in the bulletins, put them on chairs. Why? I wanted to give everybody an opportunity. You might say, well, Pastor, you know what? Uh, my, my kids can't do something. The first time I ever gave a pledge form, filled out something like this, I was a teenager. I didn't have a job. All I had was $600 in the bank. And I can't remember what I committed. But I didn't have a job. I was an 18-year-old in college. And every time you put, fill out a resume, they say, where have you worked? And I, could, I, had, I put down nothing. Because I lived overseas and wasn't allowed to work. I mean, I washed cars, mowed yards, that sort of thing. But I felt like God was telling me to put down a certain amount. And I filled that card out. And that week, I got the best paying job that you could get while you were in college. They hired me, and I worked out there for five years. My brother still works out there. And uh, it was the best paying job you could get while you were in college. And I believe it was all attributed to the fact that I gave God a soggy loaf of bread. And God did something amazing in my life. From that point on, I've always given to missions. I've always believed in missions. I believe that you can reach out and touch people. So you might say, well, you know what? I'm, I'm just a kid. Well, I'm telling you right now, I know kids who give to speed the light, who give to other areas. I know kids who pledge sometimes more than parents do. And I'm challenging you this morning. Let God do something like that in your life. You know, in Matthew chapter 16, we find the same story taking place. And in verse 8, it says, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? God can do so much in your life. So what I want you to do, on next Sunday, we're going to hear about persecution. But I want you to know that we have missionaries all over the world that are working in areas that are so sensitive, we can't, they, we can't even tell where, you, where they're at. And uh, we kind of get the blurred pictures kind of thing and the blurred photos, but they're risking their lives that we might share Jesus Christ. How many of y'all think that, you know, maybe I can give something per week. Maybe I can give something per month. And I need you to fill it out because we can't perceive, I hate to tell missionaries, we can't take you on. We don't have, there's not enough money coming in for missions. And uh, this is your opportunity to make a difference in a world that someday someone's going to walk up to you and say, you know what? Thank you so much that you gave to missions, that you were a part of that. So what I want to do this morning as we close is I want you to grab one of these. If you're a visitor, I'm not asking you to do that. And uh, I'm asking for those who are part of this church. And, um, and I want you just to hold it in your hand. And I, I want to pray a prayer. And then when I get through praying that prayer, I want you, you might want to fill it out and hand it in today. 
And, uh, but by next week, I want you to bring it back and say, here's what I've talked with my family about or my husband or my wife. And here's what we want to do. And here's what I want to challenge you with. Don't be somebody who does not fill one out. I mean, surely you can give $5 a month. I mean, I would feel, honestly, myself, I would feel like, man, to, to, to give nothing is to say, really, God, I don't care about your vision for the world. I don't want to put you on a guilt trip, but I want you to understand that because of where we live and because of who we are, we have been given a responsibility as a part of the church to help reach out and touch others. Surely we can give something. So Heavenly Father, I ask this morning, I ask this morning, dear God, may you speak to our hearts. I know that there are some here, dear God, who they got seven loaves. Some have five. But dear Lord, if we're in a situation where we only have one loaf, we're asking you to do the impossible in our lives. We're asking your God for you to reach out and to touch in such a way that dear Lord, it'll minister to us, that it'll minister to others, that it'll be a blessing, dear God, to those that we give. That we may realize, dear God, that by our missions pledge, lives are going to be touched, hearts are going to be saved, there are going to be souls in heaven because of what we have done. Dear Lord, may we give in faith so that you can do the impossible in our lives. And dear Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to caution you. Ask in faith. Don't say, well, I'll go home and think about it and give something later because, you know, what usually happens is you usually forget about it. And then you feel well, like, I'm off the hook for this year. And I'll tell you what, God wants you to do something. And for most of you, he's probably put a number in your head already of what you can give per month. Some of you, he might be stretching you. And I'm telling you, if God's stretching you, it's because he wants to do the miraculous in your life. He wants to bless you. How many are thankful that God gave? Amen. Dear Lord, I ask, may you guide us as we leave this place of worship and go into a place of service. May you direct our steps. Dear Lord, may you bless us as we step out in faith and pledge to missions. Dear Lord, may we help share your name with those around the world. Thank you for today. May you use us. We ask in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 Isn't God good?